everyday carry, my friend, Sean. I cannot believe I'm going to get to talk about everyday carry because I read every gun magazine in the world. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, dude. What's your favorite one? Uh, I really like Shotgun News. I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm kind of getting into Off Grid and all those. That's a different, uh, I don't know who publishes them, but they You're seem to You're getting into Off Grid? What would prompt you to get into Off Grid with everything going on in the world been, right now? Been watching your, <laughs> watching your show, man. <laughs> oh, you think the end of the world might be coming? I think you have to be ready. Yeah, I do too. But isn't that our responsibility to our families? I believe so. Uh, I, my wife begs to differ. My wife's from uh, New England. They don't like guns up there. Oh man, have you have, you know that? I did know that. Yeah, um, I don't believe in all this civil war stuff. You know, we're gonna have a new civil war. But I one night I got a little angry at my uh, that side of the family. I said, "Oh, this isn't gonna be like north south. This is gonna be middle of the country against each coast." And you guys already unilaterally disarmed. So. Come on. So my wife, uh, she's not a big fan of like all the guns and stuff. So, uh, but I still feel like I've got a obligation, moral obligation to my family to make sure you're ready for whatever happens. Yeah, I mean, how could you not? Especially at this day and age, with all the, with all the active shooters, the defunded, they've defunded all these police departments. Now as crime is on the rise, California. We had some good friends from California just moved here. And so not only do you have no recourse as a business owner if somebody's taking a shit in front of your business or stealing under, what is it, under uh, under $1,000 worth of merchandise in your business, not going to get prosecuted. I went, out, I went out to Portland a while ago. I had an event. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is that is the vision of what happens when you let lawlessness become the norm. And now, uh, they're ha now they're having to try to claw back decency, law, and order. Like, yeah, the shoplifting thing, like they have this video, Nike factory store. It's like the flagship store there, right? Yeah. They have videos of people just walking out with boxes of shoes. Can't do anything because they don't arrest shoplifters. For, for, and, and now their business people are like, Hey, uh, this isn't a good business model. <laughs> like we can't keep our building, we can't keep our store open down here. And then you talked about several businesses. I watched a great show. It was like public television. I'm in Portland alone again. You know, I'm like, oh man, what am I going to do? Found this fascinating public uh, television show about what's going on in Portland and how they're trying to take control again and it all came down to businesses and you brought up like the uh windows getting shattered it's business owner cafe owner like coffee shop three times i've had somebody throw a brick through my window i can't afford to keep replacing that mm -hmm. gotta shut down yeah i mean you know, it's it's interesting i know this is about edc supposedly but it's <laughs> Sorry, interesting <man. laughs> how all of these corporations who spend all this money to pr promote uh, you know, one Equity side of the aisle, whatever here, they call that thing, it's yeah. backfiring now. It's like, well, I mean, you guys funded these politicians to come in here and defund the police, which is ruining your business. Now you don't like it, so you come here to Tennessee. Just Get the saying, fuck out of here, you know. Just and, saying. But sorry, I hijacked. We're talking EDC every day. Yeah. Carry, so huh? we're well, we were talking EDC. Then then we went into off grid. Then we started going into why. We were looking into off grid, and 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 <laughs> what I was this, gonna say. This isn't gonna work for us. Sorry. I know. <laughs> what I was You're gonna like, say. Why did I invite Miller? Oh my gosh! Is is now? So it was it was businesses that have no recourse against these criminals. Now, it's not. They're not even gonna prosecute somebody that breaks into your home. Now they can break into your home, and if you're not there, they're not even gonna look into it. And um, it's just driving more and more people out of that state. But so let's go into off grid. What are you living off grid? Oh, if only, if only I got to I got to make a living. I got to. My wife. We moved around. I was in the military. We moved all around. I finally made the right decision. I used to always be the one that would go find the house. My wife was always disappointed in me. Right, <laughs> dude. Finally, I was like, honey. Why don't you go find our house in Northern Virginia? So she found it. Great location, phenomenal. Uh, 
She's very happy there. And after dragging her ass all over the world for 20 something years, actually 19 years, she said, I'll move until 20 years and then I'm not moving anymore. And I'm going to put the kids to the same school. I thought she was full of crap, right? It's like, honey, we've got a great opportunity to go overseas. Because I told you, we're not moving. I said, it's 19 years. You said 20 years. We can still move. She's like, no. It's 20. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, I'm like, not moving. Uh, she's very comfortable there. Uh, would love to uh, be financially um, accomplished and have enough resources to go establish something. But I'm, I'm not at that point yet. I worked in the military, the government for 30 something years and got to build up, got to build up the nest egg. But uh, think about it a lot. Really um, very, I think it's serious business and uh, something I think, I think all of us should take seriously. Where that would, sounds like a talking point, you know? Where would you? <laughs> You're giving me the look like, shut up. Where would you start? In terms of what? In and, terms of fuel, store. water, or location? Both, any of it. Where would you start? Where would you go in this country? If you were well, going to go you know off everybody grid. moves out there to Montana. Like, we, like, Montana has every retired intelligence officer, special operator, Delta Force, SEAL Team 6. I mean, that whole, that's probably – but they went there for a reason. And so you have to look there. I personally am in Northern Virginia. I'm going to – I got to head west. It's amazing. Uh, you're lucky you don't have to go up to D.C. much, but I love flying in. There's still a lot of undeveloped country a lot of undeveloped property around there. So I'd probably head west, go out Shenandoah Valley, uh, West Virginia type thing. Oh, okay. Put in put in my put in my stores. I I would uh I've brought up West Virginia to the wife several times. She's, <laughs> what did she she's say? not into it. She's like, no man. <laughs> Tennessee is as rural as we're getting here. Tennessee's got a lot going on here. Yeah. It's expanding big time. Yeah. But so West Virginia, what kind of terrain would you be looking for? Chuck Yeager, you know, he talks about the hollow. He's dead now. But, you know, like I want to go out there where great song about uh, the sun comes up at 8 in, or 10 in the morning, sun goes down 2 in the afternoon. You know, I want to be in there like really restricted terrain. Yeah. Really restricted. What, what about you? you? What You think that makes sense? Oh, absolutely. I think it makes sense. You know what I'm talking? Like you're in that hollow – and there's only one way in and one way out. You got that thing covered, right? Yeah. I, my primary thing was a water source. Hmm. My primary thing was a water source. I, I remember reading, do you know who Michael Berry is? Uh-huh. The, uh, the guy that called the big short. Yeah. Or the, the guy that called the financial collapse. His prediction is the next crisis is going to be we're going to run out of water. And um, I don't know why. That just always stuck with me. And then you look at today, right? Colorado River. I mean, it's no joke anymore, Sean. Right? Mm -hmm. It's no joke. Like we're run they're running out of water. There's, I, I kind of, I get into the dystopian stuff and the zombie stuff. Just keep keep skills up, right? Yeah. You got to be thinking about this stuff. Yeah. There's a great dystopian book called The Water Knife uh, about you know 2050 American Southwest. You know, with the water drying up, it's happening. Like I was just in Phoenix, kind of looking around. You're like. I'm not moving to Phoenix. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's beautiful, but who? I don't think I'd take my family there. Tennessee's good. Well, you know, there's that. There's the, the water's drying up, and then you see all these chemical spills happening all over the country all of a sudden. I don't know if the media is just picking that up as, as a fear I tactic. I wonder that, too. What do you think? I've been – there. I'm on one – how many text streams are you on? I got this one text group that I'm on. Really good people. Smart. It's not – it's not crazy – you know the crazy ones? You're like, yeah. hey, remove, remove. Uh, don't want the feds knowing that I'm on that group. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I get out of as many text threads as I can because I don't want the FBI tracking me, <laughs> so, which I'm sure they already are. <laughs> this one's legit. And if the FBI's, FBI's on it, good on them. Uh, they'll get a little taste for you know what a lot of people are thinking. Uh, but yesterday they brought that up. Do you think there's something going on here? With all these uh, chemical spills and all this stuff going on, you know, I, I know later we're going to talk about China and irregular warfare and 
I hadn't really thought of it that way, to tell you the truth. It, it, the thing I like about that chat group is it's really thoughtful. Mm-hmm. People argue back and forth, it's got to be the Chinese. And then somebody goes, come on. <laughs> you know, you really have this nice discussion. So Yeah, that would be great. I, I want to talk about this in, in your episode, but I will say that I, I can't. I got two trains of thought. One is maybe this shit happened all the time and they were just unaware of it because the media wasn't covering it. And now that China and Russia and all these conflicts are coming to light, maybe it's being elevated in the in the media a little bit because we all know that they play off fear. The other hand, I don't think I'm giving China too much credit. I mean, I just interviewed uh David McCormick, yep. and he said China leads us in, I think, 37 out of 44 uh, sectors in technology. They own our supply chain. They own a bunch of land here. They're paying off half our politicians, maybe more. They're they're behind the fentanyl crisis coming up uh, through the southern border. <sighs> COVID-19. I mean, the list just goes on and on. The spy balloons coming across. I'd yeah. love to get your input on that. But so I, I think, yeah, I think. I mean, if if I was China, I would be looking at getting all that stuff done. You know, the chemical spills. We just lost what eighteen. There was a a a, a massive explo- explosion with all those cows. Yeah, eighteen thousand cows. Eighteen thousand cows. I was listening to that in the radio when I was coming. Coming over this morning, I say, like, 18,000 cows, methane leak. You know, well, we can talk about that on the, on the, on the show because, you know, we always talk about our SCADA. What's that stand for? It's the computer architecture, systems control, whatever. You know, it's this, the software and the hardware that controls like our industrial stuff. We always said that that was really, really vulnerable to getting hacked. Because it's all old, you know. Yeah, it's all old, and nobody updates it. And you're kind of you can't help but think, I've heard this about this before. I'm I'm with you though. I'm kind of like, let, let's learn more. I'm always the same way. Is is it just because the press now has decided this is a story and they need, or is it always been going on? I don't know. I mean, here's why I think it's fear, or, or here's why I think it it's one of the two. I think it may be fear that really. I lean maybe a little more towards the fear direction because there's never any follow up. There's never it's let's bring this disaster up. Let's get everybody pissed off and scared that 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 this is China or Russia behind these explosions or these chemical spills. And then there's no follow up that's actually says this was X, Y and Z, which came from China or is tied to Russia or anything. There's never any intel after the incident. It's just a big uproar and a big shit show of let's bring exposure to it and then not actually dig into what it is. Whereas if I think it was if it was China or Russia, I would think by now so many of so many of these things have happened that I would think by now that somebody maybe Project Veritas or somebody that's trying to bring truth out, not mainstream media. But um, I think somebody would have unveiled that, hey, this this incident was tied to this, which would trigger a, a domino effect. I love you, man. You still believe. You st- No, I mean that sincerely. I want to believe that what you just said is true, but I'm also getting a little skeptical about uh, – the attention span of the American public. Mm-hmm. And it's so cliche, like, oh, TikTok and, you know, Instagram. And my my kid, I got a 21-year-old. It's really cool. I've got 29, 28, and 21. And the 21-year-old is a digital native. 29 and 28, they actually remember pre-social media, mm. I, iPhone, et cetera. My, my, my son, 21, He's on that. He's on that thing all the time. So I'm wondering if we just don't have the discipline to follow through and follow these things. Like, nope, got my, got our clicks for the day. Sold some ads. We're moving on. Who cares about the eighteen thousand cows that died? I hope you're right about Veritas and others because we got we got to have a voice. Hey, man, I'll give you a shout out for your show. You, you try. You, that's your goal. I know is like, hey, you'll bring in all sides to this thing. We'll talk about it. We'll explore ideas. Give people a chance to actually, you know, 
say what they want without a 30 second sound bite. Um, and I think that's really important. I'm not seeing it. You're not seeing what? I'm not seeing there's any interest in long form investigations uh, and whatnot. You brought up Veritas, big fan. We need more of that, though. I just think, yeah, you said mainstream media, what's going to sell, what's going to get clicks, what's going to sell some ads, we got to move on. I, I'm just not seeing the professionalism. I'm with you. However, if that were a headline that China was behind blowing up 18,000 cows or Russia was behind blowing up 18,000 heads of cattle to disrupt our food chain, I think that would be, that would get a shit ton of clicks. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. I, I would, I would think that would definitely feed the narrative. Do you for, think we, do you think we have the ability in the United States right now, even with our intelligence services, to dis- determine definitively uh, who is responsible. Because, you know, the essence of regular warfare, you know, instead of like fighting it out with tanks and all, is kind of plausible deniability that you can never tie an act to an aggressor. And I don't know if our intelligence services are good enough right now to get inside that. You've got you've had a lot of people on to talk about that, but I uh, I got no insider knowledge about like our access to uh, Chinese. Clearly, we got a lot in the Russians. I mean, it's open source that we do now, and we'll, we could talk about that. We're going to talk everyday carry, man. I'm sorry. I let's, total- yeah, let's we'll get in. We'll redo uh, this discussion in the episode. So everyday carry. You got 31 years in the military, most of which is in special operations. You worked with the CIA extensively in Bosnia, I believe, hunting down war criminals. You've been involved and taken a lot of high, high tier terrorists out, Baghdadi. What's your everyday carry now? You've well, what, got it a- is, what is it now or what would I like it to be? Well, <laughs> and you were the secretary of defense, you know, so let's talk. Well, uh, what would my, you like it to be? What would I like it to be? Classic Glock Model 19, two magazines, nice bench made uh, automatic opening knife. That's what I'd like it to be. And that's what I like. I loved, I loved growing up and learning. I was, my dad was a cop, right? And he was a v, uh, Korean War veteran. And I was like, Dad, I want to learn how to shoot. He goes, I only shoot at things that can shoot back. And I was like, I just wanted to go hunt pheasant. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> and, and clearly my dad was carrying a lot with him. You know, yeah. I realized now at the time I was just like, what an, what an asshole. So I had to go buy my own guns. I take, take my, I took my mom with me, went to Kmart, bought a Remington 870, Bushmaster, Wingmaster, great gun, paid 200 bucks for that. Paper, paper boy uh, pay. Uh, so I didn't know a lot about guns. I wasn't an expert. L- knew a lot about guns, but wasn't an expert. Came in the service. Of course, when you're in the when you're in like the straight leg infantry in the army, like you get minimal training. Started out with 1911. 1911. Nice like, government issue. It's a DC National Guard. Come on. I'm still amazed, like, oh, we have three conditions of carry on that. I was like, I will screw this up. First gun I really got trained on was a six-hour P226. And, you know, that was the first time, and you're a weapons trainer. You know, that's the one where you got the muscle memory down. Remember, we shot thousands and thousands. And, you know, so I love that gun. I finally got, I got one as a gift from a friend. Love that gun. But really, when I went to Glock, when I was uh, working with the other government agency, and we we'd shoot, wasn't like Delta Force shooting, but that was the first time where I shot tens of thousands of rounds. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have a great one of your people or somebody else you had. People, people are like, are you a good shot? I'm like, I'm not. I am not a good shot. And then I think about it. I'm not a good shot compared to like these absolute geniuses like you are, where everything goes in the A ring. Then I realized I'm probably the top zero one percent. 
Because yeah. those they're this top zero zero one, <laughs> dude. I'm like, and and I'm like, I'm so the Glock model nineteen. I used to carry. It was great. You have seventeen on your body armor, and then I have a nineteen that I could carry concealed, right? So that way I didn't have to change guns out all the time, which is, you know, not something you think about before you have a bunch of guns. Uh, so Glock nineteen uh, is my go to. I'm in Virginia, pretty liberal carry laws, but I told you. Wife, not so much. So uh, here's my everyday carry. You ready for it? Let's do it. Six inches between your ears, credit card, cash, and I still carry a Benchmade. I feel naked here. I had to fly in. I just hate, you know, not being able to have a blade on me. Uh, Always was poor. Started, you know, started off with a case, folding knife. Still have it. Love that thing. Remember Gerber kind of was the first brand. Yeah. This is what, mid 80s? So then you moved up to Gerber and thank goodness. Uh, oh man, I got a Randall as a gift one time. Is nice. that the coolest thing in the world? I obviously don't carry a Randall. Can you imagine? I should. I should carry my Randall. Do it. I just like, oh man. Uh, now I'm Benchmade guy. Just. Although I was at this gun shop the other day and I got a custom made knife. It wasn't that expensive. Really like it. Uh, so, but everyday carry, here's can I tell a quick story? Yeah, of course. I'm right, man. Starting out in the military, you're always you're always concerned that you're not prepared. So you have checklists, you've got strobe lights. Uh, dude, I'd have like eight strobe lights just in case, you know, batteries went, whatever. You're always looking for devices that you can communicate with. Uh, then I'd have tons of magazines. And as I progressed in my career, I remember going to a, a advanced force operations training course of primarily, you know, learn about surveillance detection, learning about how to operate individually. And there was this, uh, there was a guy there. He was a special duty corpsman. He was a Navy corpsman but assigned to like Marine, spe- it wasn't Marine Special Operations then. Weird, I don't know how they worked that. And we were going on a, a training exercise, deploying on a training exercise, and we're all memorizing everything and we're figuring out how to get our cheat sheets like shrunk down and put them in our shoes and crap, you know, because they would, they would inspect, they'd search you to make sure that you didn't have any incriminating evidence. And this guy... Went in clean. He goes, if it's not it, if it's not here, and I can't produce reports, and I can't do my job without having a cheat sheet, I shouldn't be in this field. And I was like, I of course was hiding all my cheat sheets, t- stitching them into my underwear and all, you know. And I got, I came to this point of clarity. It was probably in about twelve years. I was like, I want to be an individual operator who goes into a denied area with a passport and a credit card to see if I can do it. So I became very austere, man, you know, like, and, and I've still kind of gone with that because I think your spatial awareness, like I live in a neighborhood, like, you know, you got your, what, red, amber, green, you you probably teach that, I, I you know, kind of your states of awareness. I think that's really critical uh, to be able to like stay out of trouble. You know, mm-hmm. but then you. then the thing is, okay, now you get in a jam. What are you going to do? That's why I. That's where I am. I Sorry, I let on- you down. My everyday carry is wallet, cell phone, and experience and awareness. Hey, Isn't that, that's lame. I don't think it's lame. I think that's. I want to be a Glock. I want to carry my Glock Model 19 everywhere, dude. Well, everywhere. Speaking of Glock, have you seen some of the new products Sig is coming out with? No. Well, here, let me tell me more. This isn't like this isn't marketing. I got a friend over at Sig, and I told him his name's Jason. I said, "Hey, I got the former Secretary of Defense coming on, Green Beret, 31 years of service. Let's get his EDC." So he wanted me to show you this. I've really, really been looking at this gun. Really? Oh, yeah. What do you think? Because this is all the rage right now. Have you noticed how you cannot, if you go to a mass consumer 
a sporting goods store or gun shop, the only holsters you can get are for this. No kidding. Oh, uh, which you know, you know at that point, like they got something going on. This is a beautiful handgun. So that takes that actually hold, holds more rounds than the Glock 19, and it's smaller. Seventeen plus one. I know, right? Eighteen rounds. Come on. Eighteen round capacity. I'm a guy. I can hit every anything with two shots. That's why I'm a Glock guy too. This is a game changer, though, huh? That's a game changer. Plus, it has those ported that ported barrel or ported uh, slide, so it helps with uh, the. What do you so with the muzzle flip? I just uh, I've been broke my whole life, and I finally am making some money, so I can actually purchase some stuff that I always wanted to. I just bought a handgun light. Uh, you got you got anything you like best on that? That's a tough one. I always you know I always just go with Surefire. That's what we <laughs> used in the mill. And just it just with, hold up. I went with something else because I couldn't. What'd you get? Um, it's, it's a something light. I, I researched them. Here's my problem with Surefire. I could have gone online, right? I could have bought it. Easy day. I had a hard time finding. I like to go to the store. At, hey, Sean, I know you can send it back if you don't like it, but I'm old school. Like, I don't know. If I buy it. I like to go and look at it. Me and too. It's, it's really hard to find in where we are to find Surefire dealer that has all the ones. So I, I'm a Surefire guy too. This is a beautiful. They're doing really well. Well, there's a business card in there. So if you get a hold of Jason with the number on that card, I think I think he has something very similar he'd like to send you. Okay. So this is this is amazing. If, I don't know though if if you want to put the Glock 19 away, maybe pick that one up. Hey, <laughs> but, but hey, uh, but Sean, let's talk about that. Like we're always we're any special operator is a kit guy, right? Mm-hmm. You're always looking for the next thing. Yeah, as long as there's an improvement, you know. I th I think in the firearms community, it's a lot of copycats you know you see the same damn thing over and over but these guys are really innovative you know when they came out with the with the original 365 right you know they they actually designed the magazine first and then what and then the weapon around the magazine because they wanted they wanted that higher round capacity so i i, I really like i don't know what happened with sig all of a sudden they became extremely innovative and and yeah i'd love to know what happened space. I don't know if the company saw what uh, happened, but so we take uh, we hit Baghdad. It was it was like twenty years ago last week. It was so I didn't even remember it the, the date, but I saw something in one of the uh, blogs about twenty years ago this day. You know, American forces entered Baghdad, and I, I was like, oh man, texted a couple buddies who did some insane work that day. You know, and it's like, hey, thinking of you is hilarious, uh, but we we ended up. I didn't go in that day. I went in the next day. And I was with special forces. Get downtown. Uh, it was it was Uday and Kuse. I can't remember which one. One of the sons had this palace. And the 3rd Infantry Division set up their brigade. They, they That's where they set up their brigade headquarters. And I remember they had this beautiful, um, the building was really, really nice. And we had put a joint direct attack munition, a bomb, laser guided, no, well, not laser guided, GPS guided bomb right through like the the pinnacle of this beautiful did, did you ever see that palace it was where right was downtown it? it was right downtown in the green zone it was next yes. to you know where i mean it was right next to the counterterrorism force took over the building next door that jdam went right through the roof you know well our guys go start what do green berets do when they're bored go look for war trophies and apparently i never got to go in there but in the basement there was an arms room that had like basically every free, every gun ever made known to man. And what they used those for was Saddam and his brothers, instead, I'm gonna give you a coin later, instead of giving you a coin, they'd like, here is, you know, a, bre a breaded blankety blank pistol engraved, you know, from uh, from Saddam Hussein or Uday or Kuse. Damn. So the boys give me a call, they're like, sir, what gun do you want? It's like, what? It's like, sick P226. 
go in, go into the headquarters a couple days later on my crappy desk. There's just like your case there, perfect case. I open it up. The target is in there, you know, that they test fired on SIG 226. It's like, thank God. So I started carrying that because I, the bread in 92F, come on, man. Yeah. That thing, that thing, I think it was more effective throwing <laughs> it or beating somebody with it. Did you, what did you think of the 92F? That was before my time. <sighs> I've, I've shot it, I shot it for the first time after I got out with a Marine. <laughs> and I, who actually outshot me with the damn thing, believe it or not. But I picked it up and I was like, this is the shit you guys are carrying? What the hell is this? And then he proceeded to whip my ass yeah, uh, yeah. at the 25-yard line with it. It's but, a tough gun. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, so I'm a huge SIG fan, and you're right. They're, they're doing some seriously good work. And then yeah. their long guns, they've really changed the game. Yeah. Getting into the Army business. What do you think about 6.8? I got I'm embarrassed. I don't know a lot about Good. it yet. You're, it sounds cool. like it's a it's a very flat shooting round, which I would love. However, I'm pretty stocked up, and I know my holds, so I'm not looking to move to the next platform. Right. Yeah, that's where that you are. Sense. What's your go-to long gun? It's a Daniel Defense. Yeah, of uh, course it is. Nine, uh, ten and a half inch. I think they call it the Mark 10, but I get Congratu- Congratulations on being at a place in your life where you can get a Daniels defense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. What about you? What's your favorite long gun? Oh, I'm not, I don't have enough long guns because I, I told you I was broke. Uh, and I'm really searching. And, you know, may, is that another special operations thing where like, I'll spend a year just doing research? thinking like and then i'll be i'll wake up in the middle of the night i'll be like yeah what what size barrel what round you know i love i I think i love just that part maybe more than actually you know getting it uh i really don't know yet can i ask a question yeah man i got a ruger 1022 remember uh i had to buy all my own guns (laughs) because my dad was not going to buy me any guns but a ruger 1022 what do you? Th- we were talking earlier about going off grid, and I read a lot about it, and I haven't made my mind up yet. Mm. I think I. But know you got to go it. twenty-two long, or long, right? It's got to be. Why wouldn't you make that a key part of your? I don't need. I'm not getting another twenty-two. I already have twenty-two. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm struggling with what caliber to go to. Obviously, you know, okay, what's your distance? You know, I think through all that stuff. What do you need this rifle for? You know, you want to go seven six two just because it's everywhere, or five five six. But you know, there are all these other crazy rounds now that I don't understand. Yeah. So you just are a traditionalist, is what I heard you say. Is like, hey, go with what you what you've been trained on. Go with what you know. Don't try to. Don't try to get a new date to the uh, to the ball. Just, yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm just not willing. I know my shit when it comes to five five six. I know my shit when it comes to seven six two, and I know my shit when it comes to twenty two and nine mil. You know, and and I have my weapon systems that are set up for each one of those platforms, and I'm just. I'm not willing to put the time in anymore, to, okay. nor do I have the time to learn 6.8 or 50 cal or these, you know, these other rounds that are starting to come out. What's the other one that's um, the pistol round? Is it 5.7? Yeah. You know, I would love to get a, what the hell is that? The H&K MP7. But I would <laughs> love, I never, I've never, I don't have any experience with that, but... We should have been using that in the agency when I was there. It, it, it is the weapon that made the most sense for what we were doing. Um, the Brits had it. Dev Group had it. I believe the SEAL teams had it. We didn't get it. What and, were you uh, rolling with? Still MP5s for a sub? Uh, no, we were rolling with we were rolling with regular remember you know, they, M4. Remember they had Knight's Armament uh, Car 15s. For a while, they yeah. were using those. I was, I wasn't. 
I don't want to get you in trouble and get you sued for liability, so I'm just going to drop it at that. I had issues with that rifle, and it probably was operator error. With MP7? No, with Knight's with Armament the, uh, Car 15. Oh, okay. I didn't, I never, you're, we didn't have those. I've always wanted to ask people, because you know how you're embarrassed when your rifle doesn't work? You're like, <laughs> you don't want to ask, you don't want to ask anybody like, hey, are you having this problem? And they're like, hey, dumbass, like blankety blank. So you just be quiet and, you know, you try to, or I should just talk about myself. And I always wondered if it was me or if it was the rifle. I don't know. I don't have any experience with <laughs> okay, that. Okay, all right. But, um, but yeah, I, just, I thought the, M- the MP7 is just so concealable. And and I remember to talk. I remember talking to some of my buddies um, at one of the agency bars after several rounds. And um, they were talking about how they had just picked up the MP7 and how how effective it is. The range seemed pretty good. I think they said they were dumping guys at 200 yards and perfect and uh, and and not much different than a silenced or suppressed 22. So, hmm. um, so you're willing to experiment? I would experiment with that one for sure because it is. I mean, it does. It seems it just seems really effective. It's very compact and it can be and it can be big enough to to go on an assault with as well. So, but anyways, not that we're doing that anymore these days, right? Yeah. Now. Well, somebody's doing it. They, they're taking it to it in Northwest, Northwest Syria still, it looks like. So yeah, yeah. still, still a few people getting after it, but all right, well, let's get into the interview. If let's enough do of it. the EDC stuff. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.